Welcome to our special policy and practice event this evening, Israel-Palestine, what's happening and what's next. Hosted by the UCL Department of Political Science and the School of Public Policy. My name is Julie Norman. I'm an associate professor in the department and I'm very delighted to be your chair for this evening with this um, absolutely excellent panel. In tonight's event, we'll be hearing from leading analysts, practitioners and journalists who will share their perspectives on what has been unfolding in Israel, Gaza and beyond and also what the future might hold. As we do have five speakers, I'll ask each um, speaker to speak for just five, uh, four or five minutes to start. That will leave plenty of time, hopefully, for discussion and for audience questions. I'll also just introduce each speaker individually before they give their opening remarks rather than all at once now. Um, before I do that, I would just like to remind everyone who is joining us live um, that as UCL students and staff, we are bound by UCL's code of conduct and ways of working. Moreover, from a purely human standpoint, we just ask that everyone that you engage in the conversation today with courtesy, civility, and respect, and hopefully with an ethos of humility and humanity as we all navigate this difficult crisis. As I mentioned, there was plenty of time for audience Q&A in the last half hour or so of the event. You can put your questions um, to the panel by writing them in the Q&A function on Zoom. We'll then select a number of questions and put them to the panel. If you're asking a question, please indicate if there's a specific speaker that you would like your question directed to. Um, just to note, this whole session, including the Q&A, is being recorded and will be posted online afterwards on the department's website, on our YouTube channel, and also on our podcast after the event. If you're registered for the event, we'll let you know when the recording is available, and we do hope you might share it with others. So without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Um, Nick Pelham is joining us from The Economist. He is The Economist Middle East correspondent, currently based in Ramallah. He started work in Cairo as editor of the Middle East Times and has spent over 30 years studying, traveling, and writing in the region. He's the author of numerous books, most recently the book Holy Lands, which explores the region's pluralist past. And when he's taking a break from journalism, he doesn't waste any time. He's served as a Middle East analyst for the International Crisis Group, the United Nations, and many other organizations. Nick, welcome. We would love to just hear your take to start us out on, um, just to bring us up to date on what's been happening and where things stand now and your take on it from where you're based in Ramallah. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Julie. Um, so I've been, so, uh, traveling around um, um, sort of largely areas around um, uh, around uh, the conflict around Gaza journalists can't get into uh, Gaza um, and just so essentially we're kind of largely restricted to kind of looking at the ramifications and and the risk of, of spillover and it seems to me that um, while in the sort of early weeks there was a lot of concern about um, the 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 fear of spillover and that and the 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 the, the doom mongering then um, didn't come to pass. There is now a, a much greater concern of um, this conflict uh, spreading. Um, we're already seeing that in terms of kind of uh, the conflict moving down the Red Sea um, to uh, in into Yemen, but I think we're also seeing kind of the economic hit. Um, really start to manifest itself manifest itself um you know most worryingly in egypt but also in um jordan uh, i've just come from uh from cairo where uh tourism after a bumper year has has plummeted suez canal receipts are right down um the egyptian pound looks so uh, uh wobbly and um businesses are starting to to close and there's a uh that there's a there's a, there's a real risk i think that um egypt could could yeah this 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 conflict which you know many had feared would result in a sort of um a spillover in terms of sort of demographic move demographic movement and exodus of palestinians into egypt actually could be sort of moving economically um and 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 starting to Know, potentially cause some stability there um 
there's um if you uh, that I, I i've also been in amman where which is subject to similar pressures i don't think there the economy is is probably quite as as as, as vulnerable but um politically the the um there's there's real concern that whatever happened happens in egypt could could have major ramifications in um in in jordan and i think it's just astonishing that the extent to which um you know jordan remains the um the prime recipient of of uh of american aid and also one of the largest recipients of of uh, of, of, of military aid um and yet the kind of anti-american sentiment that has kind of um spiral there is it is, is quite extraordinary if you look at kind of polls from uh gallup um before october the 7th uh anti-american sentiment had had really begun to decline quite considerably and now it's kind of um it's it's soared america is far um more unpopular now than um than than iran in in much of the region and you know the um and then you look at the kind of astonishing support again in in much of the region, but I think it was particularly surprising in in Jordan for Hamas. There have been demonstrations where sort of demonstrators are, are, are waving Hamas uh, flags, and this notion that kind of um, a war which was initiated to dismantle or eradicate Hamas is actually you know, spreading its ideology um, in parts of the region like wildfire, and um, I it's these kind of it's these secondary sort of the fallout from from the war which i think we're going to be grappling with for um weeks if not months to come great thank you so much nick for giving us that regional context i know many of us are are following how the conflict might spread to other places how much it already is escalating in other places and so i imagine we'll have some questions and come back to that so thank you for kicking us off um, I'd like to turn next to Amjad Araki, who is the senior editor at 972 Magazine. He's also a policy member of the think tank Al Shabaka and was previously an advocacy coordinator at the legal center Adala. In addition to 972, his writings have appeared in the London Review of Books, The Guardian, The Nation, and many other publications. Amjad, we're absolutely delighted to have you here tonight. We just heard from Nick a bit of the regional picture, Egypt, Jordan. Can you just give us a better sense of what's happening right now in Israel, in Gaza, how it's being experienced by Israelis and, Pal by Israelis and Palestinians alike? Thank you, Julian. Thank you, UCL, for having us. Um, I won't hash out like all the details of everything that's been happening in three, over the past three months. I'm sure many people have been following it. Uh, Nick just gave at least the layout of where we're at right now in that in that regional scope. But I do want to take us just uh, you know my editorial taken away of the kind of the meta dynamics that are currently happening, uh, or what I see are currently happening between Israeli and Palestinian society. At its kind of at its huge fundamental level, what has been going on since October seventh is a massive shock to the paradigm, a massive shock to the system or, you know, or the paradigmatic shock as it is. Um, and there's a lot to unpack. I can only touch on a few dimensions of it, but at its core, I think on the Israeli side and Jewish Israelis in particular, what has happened, what happened on October 7th with the massive assault uh, that you know broke uh, Gaza's prison walls, but then also led to the massacres in many Southern communities is that um, that assault has really kind of violently woken up Jewish Israelis from a certain way of thinking and a paradigm that's very much kind of entrenched uh, in the Jewish Israeli psyche, especially under the, under the Netanyahu years. It was also existed before, but one of the biggest Netanyahu doctrines was basically enshrining in the Israeli mindset that the system, the regime and the occupation that you've been having uh, over the Palestinians could actually bring safety and security. Uh, and what October 7th did was very violently uh, at, at its most fundamental level, show Jewish Israelis that the occupation itself is not static, that there's actually always things going on and happening and that Palestinian discontent, whether or not Israelis see it that way, but the Palestinian discontent is always growing, that there's always activity and political movements going on 
because of the occupation, you know. Um, so I think this breaking of the idea that Gaza or the West Bank was static, I think, was one bit major shakeup. Uh, and the other element is exactly that it did not provide the safety. Uh, Netanyahu always prided himself as being Mr. Security, and his entire 12, 13, 14 year legacy has now been boiled down to this uh, significant fundamental moment, which Israelis really see as uh, really destroying huge parts of, uh, of how Israelis saw themselves in the region. Um, and there's a lot to say about this, but at, at its most physical level, that uh, and that fear that's been triggered by October 7th has been manifested in what can only be described as total war. Um, we're seeing this both inside Israel against Palestinian citizens and left-wing uh, Jewish critics. You're seeing it in the West Bank as well with the uh, expediting of settler violence and military violence. Uh, but of course, the biggest crux of this is in Gaza, where you're seeing one of the most vicious uh, bombing campaigns and wars that we've seen in modern history, literally outpacing the Assad regime in Syria, Russia and Ukraine, the US and Iraq. Like the, these comparative scales need to be kind of taken into account to realize that this is all happening in a very tiny strip. Um, uh, and now slowly Israelis are beginning to kind of shake out of that initial phase of vengeance. And there are new questions and debates slowly occurring, but this has really been the psychological um, kind of effect that's happened. And on the Palestinian side, again, many things to say, but at its most fundamental as well, Palestinians, especially these younger generations, are really experiencing the Nakba of their time, um, the Nakba of our time, this catastrophe, which uh, has been so fundamental to our identity and our uh, deprivation and dispossession of 1948. And we regard this Nakba as kind of always being in continuity and having these ebbs and flows and fluctuations, but that... Uh, as really, this is becoming a moment of itself, a total catastrophe that itself is almost exceeding uh, even just the basic figures of people displaced, of people killed, uh, even compared to 1948. And the shock and trauma that that's occurring uh, for Palestinians in general, but specifically in Gaza, uh, is really quite tremendous. Um, and the very fact that Gaza, which has been such a pillar of uh, Palestinian identity and society and politics, you know, has gone through a lot, you know, over the decades. But there's something about the way this operation has been conducted, and the fact that it's being turned into a place that's completely uninhabitable by the massive destruction, by all the effects that have been happening, the massive uh, forced displacement has really kind of mutated this rather resilient enclave into what's being described as a graveyard for children. And it's not that Gaza's resilience won't continue in some form, but there's something that's fundamentally, uh, deliberately being broken in that strip. Um, and just the last thing I would say is like, you know, again, there's much to say about this kind of shock to the paradigm, but the question is now, what do you replace it with? And right now you have a spectrum between a far right government, which is uh, insistent upon uh, expediting the Nakba paradigm to actually push as far as possible a repeat of mass expulsion to kick uh, Palestinians and Gaza out to the out to the strip and to try to maximize their holdings. And then you have the spectrum on the other end where people are trying to think of more um, sustainable solutions for the day after that tries to meet an equilibrium between Palestinians and Israelis. But I think the fundamental thing is that we're seeing a lot of a revert, reverting to the old ways, to the old paradigm of the Oslo Accords of some kind, of the two-state paradigm of partition. And people are seeing this as a practical uh, as, a pra as practical ways to think about this, but I think this itself needs to be critiqued and challenged. Uh, and I'm happy to kind of delve more uh, later, but I'll stop here just to uh, for food for thought. Great, thank you so much for that. And I, I think we can all agree with your description, this shock paradigm, that this is just an inflection point for Israelis, for Palestinians, for everyone in the region. And I also like that you introduced this idea of the two-state solution, this uh, you know, this kind of paradigm also that has been on um, much of our radar for many years is definitely coming back to the forefront now. And I think we'll hear more from others about that as, as we go forward um, with both um, critiques as well as um, as well as some of the opportunities that might be possible for for um, for long-term thinking. But I want to turn now to um, to Dana because you know Amjad, you talked about a lot of these um, uh, these inflection points, but also where things might go next. Um, Dr. Dana L. Kurd is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Richmond in Virginia. She's the author of an excellent book, Polarized and Demobilized Legacies of Authoritarianism in Palestine. Um, if you are someone interested in politics in the region and especially Palestinian politics, please do read her book. She is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Arab Center, Washington, DC, and a fellow at the Middle East Institute. Dana, we really would love your insights 
with your insights on authoritarianism, on politics in the region, what is the Palestinian perspective and where things might go next, the regional perspective, your take on things right now? Yeah, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting over something, so I apologize for my voice cracking. Um, thank you for having me. Um, so I thought that this would be a really good opportunity to bring up um, some latest data that we have on polling from the region. So just this week, a couple of days ago, uh, the Arab Opinion Index released uh, new data uh, with 8,000 respondents from 16 countries, including the West Bank. Um, and so we, ha we have some really interesting, I, I wouldn't say surprising, but some interesting corroborations of like what people have been saying the last couple of months. So um, first, uh, just, you know, gonna go through the, the most relevant data points for us. Um, in terms of why people think the October 7th attack happened, the top two reasons given by, by these Arab respondents in 16 countries, the first is that it was a response to the Israeli occupation. The second is that it was defending Al-Aqsa Mosque. And that's an interesting point because it goes back to what Nick was saying about the resonance of um, Hamas's framing and um, kind of the religious kind of framings and, and, and the resonance of that uh, and how, how far that's spreading. Um, so that's interesting that that comes out as number two. Um, in terms of reasons why Israel continues the war, uh, the top two reasons that were given, the first being US military support, the second being the Arab government's lack of action. So this, I think, speaks to the fact that for a lot of Arab respondents, they are tying their domestic grievances with the Palestinian issue. So we've seen protests across the region in some places smaller than we would expect, but it's still, I think, it, it, that doesn't mean that they're irrelevant um, because what we're seeing in those places, like protests in Bahrain, very recently in Egypt a couple of times as well, the chance that the people are using, the framing that people are using very much speaks to this broader discontent and how people are um, uh, mixing, not mixing, sorry, uh, <laughs> I'm losing my language all of a sudden, um, how, how they're uh, um, uh, combining, that's the word I was looking for, combining the Palestinian issue with um, their own uh, discontent around Arab authoritarianism. So I just wanted to bring up some of those chants. So in front of the journalist syndicate building in Cairo two days ago, they chanted, um, they have done it, Mandela's grandchildren, as we sit in fear, shame, and humiliation. Another chant they said was, as long as Arab blood is cheap, down with every president and leader. Of course, these rhyme in Arabic, but um, th that's, you know, the point here is that's very much on people's minds that they are upset with both their domestic politics and their and the regional politics. And it's not a new phenomenon. Um, the Palestinian question often motivates regional um, uh, discontent. And, and this, I think, should figure more heavily in American and Western calculations. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, um, the third point I wanted to bring up is uh, opinions of the United States. So. 76% of respondents uh, um, in, in this survey say that their opinion of U.S. policy towards the region has gotten worse since the war. 94% evaluate the U.S. response to the Israeli war as bad or very bad. And 81% say that the U.S. has never been serious about establishing a Palestinian state in the occupied Palestinian territories. So very, very negative evaluations of U.S. foreign policy. They've only gotten worse. This is not new. These are not new trends, but there have been severe worsenings um, in, the, in the latest polling. Now, in terms of back to the original question of like what Arab respondents want, um, this was asked in this in this survey. So we know the top two things people are saying they want. The first, what Arab respondents want outside the West Bank is that um, they want Arab governments with relations with Israel to suspend relations with Israel. That's the first thing that comes up at, at the top of the list. The second is to deliver aid to Gaza. Um, now, the, in this particular polling, they're not asked about one state or two state solution or things like that. I, but I do have data from the Palestinian Center for Survey and Policy Research that we can um, we can talk about if, if people are interested that polls Palestinians in particular. I will say um, what Palestinians want kind of in the medium to short ter short to medium term is, I think, pretty clear if you read what Palestinians are saying and, and kind of plug into Palestinian social media and things like this. The first is that they don't want political solutions without a ceasefire. So there was a uh, letter circulated, um, uh, partly uh, uh, generated by act activists in Gaza, where people are saying, you know, if, if you are pushing for political solutions and having these discussions about what should happen next in the day after without a ceasefire, you're using the cover of war to establish new realities on the ground, and they reject that whole process. There needs to be a ceasefire and then the discussion. 
Um, so, you know, surprise, Gazans and Palestinians generally want to have a say in what happens to them. Um, they don't want um, an imposition of leadership. And I think the Palestinian Authority knows this. So a prime, the Prime Minister Shteya, you know, very clearly said, we, we don't want to be seen as arriving on the back of an, of an Israeli tank. Um, and they don't want a reshuffling of leadership. They don't want, um, okay, well, we'll, okay, we'll remove Mahmoud Abbas, but we'll bring Dahlan or we'll, you know, like the, the same faces that, that uh, um, keep uh, uh, emerging as possible solutions. Um, what people are talking about is that without elections, and I think there's also a strain of thought about with reviving the Palestine Liberation Organization without doing those things, and also without talking about Hamas and Hamas disarmament, the, all of these kind of political solutions are non-starters. They might achieve some semblance of control in the short to medium term, but as October 7th very much highlights, and back to what Amjad is saying, like that, these are not sustainable solutions. Um, Ex-Prime ex Minister Salam Fayyad even wrote an article in Foreign Policy about how Hamas has to be integrated into the Palestine Liberation Organization. So whether you agree or disagree with any of those things is kind of irrelevant to the fact that these discussions are happening amongst Palestinians and they're not at all being reflected in what the political solutions um, people are talking about um, in the halls of Washington. Um, and finally, people don't want normalization. Arabs don't want normalization, Palestinians don't want normalization, and they don't want some sort of solution on the back of Arab-Israeli normalization. So the Biden administration has consistently and very alarmingly in the last couple of days talked about how they still want Saudi-Israeli normalization and like the Palestinians will get something out of it. Um, I mean, I'm just gonna be very blunt here. Like the fact that this is still being talked about is just astounding. Um, given the low level of support around the region and in Palestine, I mean, the idea that Arab-Israeli normalization comes first before resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is just yet again predicated on this idea that we can impose policy on the region because I think people assume it's an authoritarian region and like people's, you know, the public opinion really doesn't matter. But again, this is very unsustainable. Um, the last thing I'll say is that we have polling from September, as well as from December, from the Palestinian Center for Survey and Policy Research, that talks about one state versus two state versus, you know, armed armed resistance, armed tactics, all of these things. Um, I, what we're seeing is there is a growing support for the use of armed tactics, in especially in the aftermath of October 7th, and especially in the aftermath of the, the war on Gaza, um, and that there's very little support I'm, I'm not saying, I can't remember the exact number, sorry, I don't have it in front of me, but it's, I'm, I think it's between 20 and 30%. So little support for a one state, um, but also quite low support for a two state. And what that reflects, I think, is not the fact that, you know, just people would prefer to be up in arms and prefer for a violent solution, um, but it reflects the, the lack of um, political horizon that has been created. Uh, uh, for Palestinians, and so people are really um, they're they're reflecting that in their in in these kinds of uh, 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 polling results. But that's not to suggest that something else cannot be discussed. Some other you know future can be imagined that can um, uh, be sold to the Palestinians. But in the in the scenario that we're talking about, especially in the aftermath of October seventh and the war in Gaza, and complete American support for the Israeli behavior. Um, it's hard to convince the Palestinian public that a two-state solution or a one-state or, you know, whatever it is, um, like that Israelis will ever come to the table for that um, without that kind of international pressure. And that's really been missing. So, um, yeah, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. But we can talk more about what I mean by the international dimension and all those things in the Q&A. Thank you so much for all the um, the public opinion perspective, which is just invaluable to hear um, regionally as well as um, within uh, within Palestine. And I think you raised some really interesting points about U.S. foreign policy, which I know Aaron will will touch on in a few minutes, and also about you know what possible uh, resolutions might look like, which I, I know Jeff has worked on a lot as well. So we'll turn to Jeff Halper next, who is an Israeli anthropologist. He's the director of the Israeli Committee Against Home Demolitions and also a founding member of the One Democratic State Campaign. He's also the author of multiple um, excellent books, uh, most recently, Decolonizing Israel, Liberating Palestine, 
Zionism, settler colonialism, and the case for one democratic state. Um, Jeff was the first person I heard speak about a one state solution back when I was a university student. And uh, he was um, campaigning about that at that time and uh, was always very, very eloquent and uh, and has always been a, a very solid um, activist in, in, uh, in the region as well. So Jeff, can you tell us a bit about your take on where things are now, where the Israeli left stands, how that might evolve, and how the one-state model might play into that. Um, <clears throat> thanks for having me. It's been a really good discussion so far. Um, let me start by saying, uh, in some ways, uh, Israelis have certainly been shaken, even traumatized by what happened on October 7th. That's for sure. But I don't think it's really been a shock to the paradigm. On the contrary, I think Israelis are entrenched in, in the, the paradigm, um, partly because they have nowhere to go. I mean, they're trapped by a few different things. First of all, they're trapped by their own Zionist ideology. I mean, the very purpose of Zionism, of Israel, was to replace Palestine with a Jewish state, to transform an Arab country into a Jewish country. And we've done that with the settlements. And of course, the operational expression of that are the facts on the ground. I mean, Sharon began already in 1977, a, a concerted campaign to create facts on the ground, massive facts, settlements and highways and a whole grid of control, what I call a matrix of control that will foreclose any possible negotiations in the future. And now Israel's had, you know, 40 some years to do that without any interference whatsoever internationally. So we have the facts on the ground that even if Israelis did all of a sudden wake up one day and say, hey, wait, we, we have to make peace with the Palestinians, it would be impossible because you're not going to move 750,000 Israelis out of the West Bank and East Jerusalem and back into Israel. So that, so that in some ways, Israelis are trapped. They have nowhere to go. And so that means that they're entrenching in the, in the if you want to call it their paradigm, or in the ways, and they have no horizon. I mean, we're talking about Palestinians having, in a way, Israelis have no horizon as well, except there's another issue here that, that we have to bring in, and that is that Israelis nevertheless feel that they're winning. So Maybe not the people so much, but certainly the government feels that actually Israel is winning because, you know, Israel is so strong. I wrote a book about this called War Against the People. How does Israel get away with this? Uh, Israel feels that it's so strong in terms of um, of the military and security and policing technologies and weapon systems, surveillance systems, that it's feeding into all kinds of countries, from the United States and Europe down to the equ Equatorial Guinea. <laughs> I mean, there's almost no country that doesn't have, you know, Israeli uh, arms, arms in it. Um, that in, in effect, it has a very wide base of support in the world that uh, even though we kind of think of it as a client of the US, if we look at the BRICS countries that are the alternative system emerging, almost every BRICS country has, except South Africa today, has very close relations with Israel, including China. You know, Israel is the number two arms supplier to China after Russia. Israel is the number two arms supplier to India after Russia. So let's not just think that somehow uh, there's only one or maybe with Europe, two major patrons of Israel. In fact, the idea of somehow Israel being dismantled as a Jewish state, or somehow its 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 integrity, if you want to put it that way, would be threatened by a Palestinian state emerging, is not necessarily something that has a wide appeal outside of the Arab and Muslim worlds. And I think Israel uh, relies on that. So I think what's coming down the road, and Biden is talking about this all the time, is what I call two-state apartheid. That's the only way out for the international community and for Israel. And that is to basically say, yes, the apartheid system, may, may, maybe make it a little nicer cosmetically, but basically you're gonna have the state of Israel on 80 some percent of the land of the country, and you're gonna have a Palestinian trans sky on the other 15 or so percent. And that's the only place the international community can go. And I think the only place that Israel can go. And that's something we have to oppose. And that's why I'm in the One Democratic State campaign, because I think the fatal flaw of the Palestinian struggle 
is that there is no end game. You cannot be in a political struggle without a political plan and, of course, a political vehicle. So I realized that the pal there, there are uh, 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 movements to try to maybe resuscitate the PLO. There are some young Palestinians that say, wait, we don't want a PLO. We want another kind of more grassroots, whatever the vehicle is that's necessary. But, you've, but you can't put off the idea of a political plan. Otherwise, you're not an actor. And I think, I think we've seen a tremendous outpouring of support for the Palestinians in the world, certainly among the people, including the Arab peoples. Because don't forget, Israel's relying on the fact that Saudi Arabia and the Arab governments do want normalization with Israel. They don't care about the Palestinians. Saudi Arabia said last week that forget what's happened, we still want normalization with Israel. So that, you know, that's that's a situation. And therefore, uh, and therefore, I think in my view, and in, in, in this one democratic state campaign a group that we have, is that there has to be a Palestinian proactive voice that does begin to uh, advocate for a political program, which we think is one democratic state over the entire country. And that it's true that Israel is not going to be a partner, like the whites weren't in South Africa, but the, the huge ally of the Palestinians are the peoples of the world. And that we can see. But the peoples of the world that are already mobilized for Palestine and Palestinian rights are floundering. They have nowhere to go unless the Palestinians can show a way forward. Give them a political horizon. And therefore, you know, I think it's urgent for the Palestinians and, and, and you know, together with the critical Israelis like me that support them to begin to really we have to dictate and decide and advocate for what's going to happen the day after. And unless we want apartheid, it's going to have to be a one democratic state. We're going to have to decolonize the Zionist settler colonial system and transform Israel and the occupied territories into one democratic state. So I think that's not just some political horizon that's theoretical or for this is really I think an urgent part of the struggle. Jeff thank you so much for giving that perspective and, and bringing uh, that element into the discussion. We've heard a lot about um, criticisms I think so far of U.S. foreign policy of, of the two-state solution. I'd like to now turn last uh, but definitely not least to Aaron David Miller. Um, Aaron's a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace where he focuses on U.S. foreign policy He's also the author of multiple books, um, including The Much Too Promised Land, America's Elusive Search for Arab-Israeli Peace. If you're interested in this conflict, if you're interested in US foreign policy, I highly recommend this book. Um, for over 25 years, he served at the State Department as an analyst, a negotiator, and an advisor to our Republican and Democratic Secretaries of State. And he helped formulate US foreign policy on the Middle East and the Arab-Israel peace process most recently as a senior advisor for Arab-Israeli negotiations. Aaron, we love your take. We've all been hearing a lot about U.S. involvement, U.S. support for Israel. Um, I think it's a bit more nuanced than that. Um, can we, we'd love to hear your perspective. Should know better. Um, thanks, Julie. And it's, it's great to be here with Amjad and Jeff and uh, Nick and Dana. And of course, you. Let me make quick uh, six quick observations. Number one, for an administration whose national security strategy document in the fall of 2021 posited a significant pivot away from the Middle East to more important priorities in the Indo-Pacific and Ukraine. And by the way, this was a year or so before Putin's invasion of Ukraine. I think the uh, events of October 7th and what followed uh, was a real shock. Um, I, I suspect that the administration understood the volatility of the Israeli-Palestinian issue, but uh, most analysts, myself included, expect that if, in fact, an, an explosion would come, it would come out of the West Bank, not uh, as a military operation launched by Hamas um, and the regional implications, consequences that have followed. Um, second, having tethered itself to uh, Israel's war aims, uh, the president, until until today, would not or could not use the leverage that he has, in theory, 
uh, which most American presidents, administrations that I've worked for had in theory, to restrain or constrain uh, Israel's actions. Um, three, three reasons um, seem to me drive the president's policy. Number one is his persona. Um, Joe Biden alone among American presidents feels literally this extraordinary emotional bond uh, with the idea of Israel, the people of Israel, the security of Israel. And I think um, that the events of October 7 have fundamentally shape this emotion, deepen this emotional commitment. The presidential model here, by the way, is not uh, Barack Obama, for whom Joe Biden worked. It's Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton knew very little about Israel until Yitzhak Rabin handed him a piece of history with the Oslo Accords. And Clinton, like Biden, even though they're of different generations, developed this extraordinary bond. Uh, at Camp David in July of 2000, I had both Israelis and Palestinians coming up to me and saying, why can't Bill Clinton be our uh, be our president? Um, second is the politics. And while the administration, Biden, has lost some support among progressives and in a very important demographic, 18 to 29-year-olds, if you believe Nate Cohn of the New York Times, this group, 18 to 29-year-olds, African-Americans, Hispanics, and young voters, uh, Trump is doing much better than Biden among them. Uh, so there's no question that uh, Israel and Gaza has amplified those concerns. At the same time, the president is navigating this very fraught course between a Republican party that looks at itself as the Israel can do no wrong party on one hand, and a deeply divided Democratic party among progressives, but most traditional mainstream Democrats, some who are willing to speak out, but most who are not, who want to stay away from imposing costs and consequences, particularly in view of uh, what they see as the October 7 uh, terror surge. And then finally, president's caution, risk aversion when it comes to dealing with Israel uh, is driven by the fact that on three central questions of this war, the administration has no better answers uh, than the Israelis have. Number one, how do you uh, destroy Hamas as a military organization without wreaking injurious harm and injury and death upon thousands of innocent Palestinians, particularly in a situation where Hamas is embedding its military assets in and around and below civilian structures of populations. Number two, how do you surge humanitarian assistance into a free fire zone, which is essentially what Gaza has become as a consequence of Israel's ground campaign? And then finally, what do you do about the day after? Um, the administration, well, we can get to that in a minute, but th those those limitations, I think, in addition to the president's persona and the politics, explain to me satisfactorily um, why the administration has not uh, used the leverage that it has. And it has leverage. It could do three things if it wanted to. It could slow walk, restrict, or even um, deny Israel military assistance, particularly munitions. Number two, it could change its voting posture in New York, abstain or vote for a UN Security Council resolution, and in what the Israelis would regard as a nuclear option, it could agree with most of the international community and, and most of the planet that what is required here is a full cessation of hostilities, dealing with everything after, but a cessation of hostility. He could do these things. But the constraints have I have I, one, I think, um, push them in the other direction. A third regional escalation. The administration has put a lot of stock, uh, deployment of two carrier strike groups with over 200 strike aircraft in an effort to um, deter. I think uh, the administration, it, both because Iran, neither Iran nor Hezbollah want a major escalation, and I, I guess I would put the Israelis in, the, in that same category in, in key areas. So far, even though it looks as if we're on the cusp of a regional war, we, we aren't. And when I say regional war, I mean the following. A major Israeli-Lebanese war, which, go, which would go beyond what happened in the summer of 2006, with, with Hezbollah using um, much of its uh, repository of high trajectory weapons, uh, which cover most of Israel. The Israelis preempting or countering with a massive ground, air, and sea campaign, destroying Lebanese infrastructure. Thousands of Lebanese would perish. Hundreds of Israelis would die. 
uh, pro-Iranian uh, militias would um, strike out at American forces in Iraq and Syria. The Houthis would escalate. Uh, the Americans would become involved. There's no question about it. And you could envision, if it were a true regional war, Israel and or the United States striking Iranian assets in the Gulf or in Iran proper, and Iran responding. That is a regional war. That is something the Middle East has not experienced, never experienced. And as long as Gaza continues, there is certainly the possibility of such a scenario. Uh, four, um, the president said there's no going back to October 6. It's a rather extraordinary statement because what it suggests that he would have to do in the event he was serious, serious about this. Uh, but it seems to me highly unlikely. Um, in order to have anything happen, either in Gaza or on the um, putative possibilities of a political horizon, uh, whatever conclusion you come to, uh, Confederation, Palestinian state, whatever, you really would need leaders who are masters of their politics, not prisoners of their ideologies. And you don't have them on either side um, in Israel or, or Palestine. Um, F5, um, 2024, in my judgment, will be the year of Gaza. The Israelis will continue to operate militarily there. The Israelis will not succeed in, in destroying Hamas. Hamas will likely emerge uh, still capable of dictating both the economy and the politics of Gaza. Whether Hamas will be able to reconstitute itself as a military force is a highly arguable proposition. Uh, but I see very little chance of uh, moving Gaza into the direction of uh, a situation where 2.3 million people uh, get better government, real security, and uh, are put on the road to prosperity. And finally, should Biden get a second term, it's conceivable that um, something better could happen, both in Gaza and with respect to providing a better pathway between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, but frankly, it, it's it's hard to imagine. You're going to be dealing with two traumatized communities who are essentially leaderless. Um, and it's very difficult for me to imagine uh, that these traumas won't affect uh, both the politics, the political culture, and the prospects for any serious uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, reconciliation. Aaron, thank you so much for that overview and for really um, unpacking some of the U.S. foreign policy motivations and the way that it's currently playing out. Um, I think all the speakers have raised a number of um, excellent points, and we have a number of questions coming in. Um, I would like to encourage anyone who would like to ask a question to please put it in the Q&A box. And if there is a particular speaker who you would like to address it, please note that as well. Um, but I think I'll start and kind of combine uh, the first two that have come in that have touched on elements that several of our speakers mentioned. Um, the first is, um, you know, we've heard uh, from Saudi Arabia, from um, in particular, that uh, that one of the um, one of the thoughts for for a, a, a next day or um, the day after kind of approach would be establishing relations with Israel in exchange for establishing a Palestinian state with Israeli and Western recognition. Um, a question to the panelist: Could this ever work? Um, especially when, uh, as Dana said, much of the um, public opinion is against this. Or as the questioner asked, when Netanyahu himself has explicitly said he does not want such a state to be established. Um, I think this goes uh, ties in a bit with the second question, um, again, referring to Netanyahu's comments that he opposes a Palestinian state after the war, whether through this mechanism or another. So um, what do you do with that situation when you have Netanyahu saying very vocally, that's a no-go, where you, as you have the US, many Arab states and many others saying that that is um, a, a condition. So would anyone like to start us on that? I, I, I'd, offer, oh. I'd offer a view on the Israeli-Saudi uh, US normalization issue. I mean, you, ha you have a king, a would-be king, excuse me, he's not king yet, uh, in his late 30s, who could conceivably rule Saudi Arabia for half a century. 
uh, he's looking beyond Benjamin Netanyahu, who is he's looking beyond uh, Joe Biden. Uh, MBS wants certain things from the United States. He wants a mutual defense treaty. He wants help with his nuclear program. Um, I think he's pursuing a strategy in which his flexibility on what it would mean to satisfy Saudi requirements, Saudi national requirements on a Palestinian solution of Palestinians are extremely flexible. Obviously, he's going to need something more than what he was prepared to, to settle before October 7. But I would suspect if you got a, a new constellation in Israel, uh, a center-right government, uh, which lacks its ex the extremist elements that exist now, that you could, I could conceivably see MBS uh, and the Israelis under American auspices engaging in a a pathway to normalization. I think it's it's much harder now, but I don't think you can underestimate this individual, Mohammed bin Salman, and what he believes are the needs and requirements of, of an authoritarian uh, Saudi Arabia. Okay. Dana also wanted to come in, I think. Thank you. Yeah, um, I just wanted to also point out um, that, so we've, I, this really feels like theatrics <laughs> because we've seen this before as well um, with the UAE when it normalized relations with Israel, the whole theatrics in front of the media was that they uh, were able to convince Netanyahu not to formally annex the West Bank. Um, and so, you know, all this talk about how because of that, because of that normalization, uh, Israel did not formally annex the West Bank, which, I mean, really has no bearing on how people live anyway, because it's already kind of de facto annexed. Um, so I think what's like, I also don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility that there would be some sort of normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel. But what is going to happen is that they're gonna claim to come to some conclusion, calling it a state without actually having any elements of what a state would require. So it would re it'd be a state without sovereignty. Netanyahu has said this, other actors in the Israeli po you know, political landscape have said this, Yitzhak Rabin has said this, they would get something less than a state. So it's really about conceptually stretching the term state to pretend that the final versions of the Bantustans that already exist are what that state is gonna become. And it's gonna be a state without any sovereignty. But this doesn't solve the problem. This doesn't solve the actual crux of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because Palestinians don't want something less than a state. They want sovereignty. They want governance that upholds their national identity. They want control over their environment. They want the right to defend themselves. The, these are things that there's no Israeli actor, um, center right. You know, I know people talk about Gantz and like Galad and whatever, but like none of them have expressed a willingness to go that far to discuss a state with actual sovereignty. Um, and even if the Americans put on the show of like Saudi Israeli normalization, the Palestinians get something, some road to state, it, it's not going to actually solve the issue. And, and people, especially like the Palestinian public, are especially very fed up. I'm not suggesting that the international community should not intervene. I think they need to uh, because the power imbalance between Israelis and Palestinians is so severe. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, it's got having these spillover effects for global security and for American interest in Ukraine and all these things that we should be better spending our time on instead of um, defending uh, the ongoing status quo. But um, the, like this kind of international intervention is, is a show. It's, it's not meaningful. So I just wanted to say that. Um, I'd like to bring in Nick on this and then I'll move on to another. Um... Mm -hmm. um... Yeah, and I think there's there's deep disillusion with uh, Western efforts to resolve this, um, but I, there may be less disillusion with um, with 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 Arab. I think yeah, Anna's absolutely right about kind of making um, comparisons with the UAE, but you can also make comparisons, which I think may be more relevant, um, to um, 50 years ago, and it was significant that you know, Hamas launched their attack on. 50th anniversary of um, the 1973 war. And that had a similar traumatizing effect on, on, on Israel. I think it's far too soon to know whether Israel is just going to entrench with uh, itself with an old paradigm or whether it's going to you know, 
take stock. Um, I think what you can say is that, you know, whether you're on the right or the left, Netanyahu doesn't feel like he's a representative of, you know, where Israel wants to go in the future. Um, for most Israelis, he's deeply unpopular. The right looks very fragmented in the way that the left used to look in the past. And when you kind of start to get reservists coming back from, um, for Israeli reservists coming back from the front, they're going to bring a lot of their grievances that they had sort of pre-October the 7th with them. Um, and I think you could start to see Israeli yeah, domestic politics um, uh, reassert, reassert itself. Um, and that could provide for an opportunity for um, a leader from the Arab world to come in and say, you know, there is an alternative out there. And you know, it's not impossible that M MBS is looking at the past. He's not looking at MBZ, with whom he has sort of significant differences, but he may be looking at Anwar Sadat and the chance of um, trying to take a, a dramatic, bold state, which was a step which could ch you know, change the political paradigm. And there may be an opening when, you know, as Jeff said, Israel doesn't have um, answers. It doesn't have a political horizon at the moment. And it might be that MBS could offer that in the future. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to move us on to another set of questions, and I, I will note the um, attendee who um, you kind of uh, acknowledged the fact that we don't really have a mainstream Israeli perspective on the panel, and I, I own and acknowledge that as well, that we haven't really heard that viewpoint. Um, I think one of the other questions um, brings it out a bit also on this idea of um, building on what we were just speaking about with Netanyahu's stance. And that attendee um, asked, you know, Netanyahu might fall into this more oppositional category, um, but from the Israeli point of view, historically, the only partner um, for peace has, um, there has been a lacking of a partner for peace, this idea that um, Israel has come to the table, peace plans have been um, rejected on numerous occasions, often resulting in violence. So why should the onus be on Israel to, refundam to re uh, fundamentally restructure itself um, when uh, other previous um, overtures towards peace have not uh, been uh, been accepted by the Palestinian side. Um, I guess I would also add to this just the more current um, Israeli perspective, as, as some alluded to, you know, this real um, existential um, uh, trauma in Israeli society right now, um, a real need to feel that the threat of not only Hamas, but other hostile actors um, does not remain and continue to threaten the country. Um, and even a continuing concern for the hostages, a question that, you know, why isn't there more pressure on Hamas to uh, release the hostages rather than pressure only on Israel for the ceasefire? So I'm not sure if anyone would like to pick that up and uh, maybe engage with some of the concerns from a more, what I would say is a pretty mainstream Israeli um, perspective right now. Should Jeff, I, would you want to go for it? As a non-mainstream Israeli, certainly. <laughs> Look, we need a really, we need, we need, the critical people, a, a paradigm shift of our own. This is not a conflict. We all talk about the Israel-Palestinian, it's not a conflict. The conflict is between two sides. And they get, they get into a fight about something. And the way you resolve a conflict is through negotiations. This is a matter of a settler colonial, and I know this is becoming almost a mantra, but it's really important. This is a settler colonial uh, a project that Zionism has imposed on Palestine. It's unilateral. It had Zionism had nothing to do with the Arabs, as they called them. They didn't know about Arabs. They didn't care about Arabs. They were irrelevant. And the idea is we're coming in to reclaim our country exclusively. It was a form of, of Eastern European ethno-nationalism, which is where the, most of the Jews lived, where Zionism came from. And that's really important because then, then that means that there is no compromise here. If you say, this is my country, and we mean the Zionists from the river to the sea, we mean the entire land of Israel, not the Israel within the 67 borders, because what you call the West Bank, we call Judea and Samaria. That's the heart of the land of Israel. The idea that somehow you can, as the map sort of indicates, you can detach the West Bank from Israel and have a Palestinian state is ridiculous. This is the heart of the land of Israel. 
So you have a situation, and now again, reinforced with the facts on the ground, in which there simply is no willingness to negotiate. There's nothing to negotiate. And uh, and 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 there's no reason to negotiate because we're winning in a sense. The, you know, nobody is saying dismantle the settlements. And so and so that means then that uh, this whole idea that we've somehow uh, been rebuffed in terms of our reaching out for peace. What in the hell does peace mean? If we talk about you know Palestinian needs, the minimal needs, even in a, a weird two state solution, in which in which uh, 9 million or, you know, 12 million, 14 million Palestinians worldwide have to settle with 22% uh, of their homeland. Even with that ridiculous idea of the two states, um, there is no willingness on the part of Israel, uh, you know, to do that. And so in a sense, uh, you know, we have to look even in that minimal way of, let's say, a Palestinian state, a viable, and Donna, Donna mentioned the word, a sovereign state. Israel would never agree with that. This, the essential elements of its military doctrine is control of all the borders. But add to that viability. It has to be economically viable. It has to have territorial contiguity. It has to have sovereignty, control of its borders. It has to have Jerusalem, which is the economic heart of any Palestinian state with, with tourism, which is the largest industry. So Israel re rejects all of that. So the idea that somehow they can accept what we, the crumbs that we give them, a Bantu stand, you know, and the fact that they never accepted Trans Sky, which is all that was offered to them if, at best in Oslo, and today not even that, um, you know, doesn't mean that they rebuffed in, in bad faith our good faith. We never entered in negotiations in good faith. Never. In the seven years of Oslo, let's remember, we're talking about, I don't know what, because the two-state solution was not referenced in Oslo, but, you know, we're talking about something. In 1993, there's 200,000 settlers. In 2000, when Oslo collapses, there's 400,000 settlers. So what, what are we talking about, about reaching out for peace? This is a unilateral settler colonial enterprise that is now, if you want to know where we are today, it feels that it's in the stage of mopping up. We're going to get rid of Gaza that we never wanted. And we are, you know, the big issue here, although we're not looking at it, is what's happening in the West Bank. And in the West Bank, we're finishing the ethnic cleansing of area C of the West Bank. And basically, we have an apartheid system. What remains, and I go back to this, and, and Biden is exactly feeding into this, what remains is to, is to formally establish a two-state apartheid, Israel and trans sky, a Palestinian trans sky. And, and that is something, that's good enough. So if you're saying, what about the Arab states? You could sell that. You could cosmetically sell that two-state apartheid I think in a way that, you know, it's good enough. Nobody's going to check all the details of is it genuinely viable and sovereign. So this whole idea that somehow Israel in good faith has ever tried to address Palestinian needs, I think is absolutely, is ridiculous. And Jeff, I, there's a number of questions still about, about one state models in the Q&A that we may or may not have time for. But I, I see Aaron wants to come in on this yeah, one. I just and need to offer a, a quick comment. You know, not even Pythia the Oracle at Delphi, in all of her extraordinary capacity to divine the future, would ever make the point that Jeff is making. History, the arc of history, and Jeff knows this, or maybe not, the arc of history bends in strange and unpredictable ways that no human can foresee or divine. Had I told Jeff that apartheid might end someday, he might have he might basically have re reverted to the arguments that he's making now. But apartheid did end. And it ended in a way that nobody, no human, looking at the situation in the 80s and early 90s would ever have imagined. So I mean, Jeff has a formidable argument. There's no question about it. He deals with empirical realities. 
but it is virtually impossible for anybody to sit and say, I have two, I'm, I'm going to be 75. I've got two 40 year olds. I'm not going to tell them never. I'm not going to tell them that the American Republic is doomed in the event that the Republican, presumptive Republican nominee wins the presidency. How can I say that? And I certainly wouldn't say it to an Israeli and Palestinian condemning themselves, their children, and their children's children to the kind of future that Jeff is outlined. It's beyond human imagination, Jeff, to mortgage the future in the way you are doing. And even if I argued now that you are 100% correct looking at the situation, on January 18th, 2024, you don't know the ending. With all due respect. Can I have 30 seconds? Just you to don't respond to 30 ending. seconds. I, I know you're... Well, I'm not saying I'm done. not saying I'm by no means fatalistic. On the contrary, it started by saying we're de we're trying to develop a political program. I think there is an end game. We have to struggle for it, and that's one democratic state. So don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm saying that that the two state apartheid is what Israel wants, what the United States wants, and what most of the national community will get will go along with. Therefore, we. The Palestinians and their Israeli allies, Israeli Jewish allies, we have to come up with our own program. We have to mobilize our own forces. We have to enter the political game. And that's the only way in which we're going to prevent this otherwise, I believe, inevitable two state apartheid from happening. But I certainly don't look at this in a fatalistic way that this is the hope is. I don't believe in hope. I believe in struggle. The struggle is. I think the only way out is for one democratic state. That's okay. my view. There could be other alternatives, but certainly I'm not fatalistic in saying two-state apartheid is what's going to happen. Thank you, Jeff, and also Aaron. I, this could just, this, that part of the discussion, we could we could stay on for so long. I do want to bring um, Amjad and um, perhaps uh, Dana back in for a couple of the questions. We've just been talking about um, you know, from Jeff's point of view, what um, what it means from kind of an Israeli state um, and, and and that kind of politics. But there's a question in terms of what are the opportunities or tools that populations in Palestine and Arab countries or other parts of the world can use to influence um, the crisis? Um, and uh, and also a question that had um, been been directed first to to Dana, saying, you know. Um, the politics has become perverted, as you said, how to restore it, what kind of scope is there for a progressive Palestinian leadership that can also run a modern state um, in the way that many would like to see. So I'm not sure if maybe Amjad would like to start us out and then um, if Dana would like to comment also. Sure. I mean, in terms of um, in terms of leverage, and this kind of comes back to some of the things we were mentioning earlier, the mobilization that's been happening on many different political camps just for a ceasefire it's been quite telling, I think, of the dissonance, and this also touches on what Dana was speaking about, this dissonance between where most people understand needs to be done, even just as a first step, and these policy, or let's say, positions of power and policymakers who really have the, those levers of power to actually exercise it. And it's not just about Washington, even though a lot of this is literally lying on, on the White House for buying into the narrative that a ceasefire is somehow a weapon of war rather than a way to end it, even, tempor even temporarily for a week or a month or a year. So there's something a little twisted to that, whereby we are seeing this massive movement, but it's not breaking this dam uh, of where that leverage needs to be applied. And in many ways, people are almost giving up hope also in the United States, at least for now, even at, you know three plus months later, with uh, thousands and thousands of people killed, we're witnessing from what people could predict from day one of the war and that still hasn't translated into real actions. So people through protests and through this, through from university to the streets, you name it, are mobilizing in that respect. Like that is a form of leverage and it is uh, causing cracks. It's even causing cracks, even as we speak in the United States, as Aaron was is saying, like there's ramifications for this into the way that Israel-Palestine has been so, has been turned into such a domestic political issue for the better and the worse, uh, that 
there are those effects, even if it's a bit long term. Uh, this also this comes back a little bit to a discussion around the region and about the Arab states. And to be frank, the Arab states do have leverage, but they have too many conflicts of interest to actually use it insofar as our Palestinians, uh, especially so far as the Palestinians are concerned, whether it's Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, etc. Uh, you know, Dan says like you know, no, none of those Arab states is interested in coming back on the back, coming to Gaza on the bank of an Israeli tank. No one is interested in bankrolling reconstruction if it just means that it's going to be destroyed yet again in a couple of months or next year or in two years' time. And so there's, so the Arab states are kind of setting this line, saying that we need a blueprint for toward the two-state solution in order to get our participation. And they're perceiving this as leverage, but it's not because they. Because this comes back to the issue of normalization of the past few years, one of the significant pieces of normalization between Arab states, Arab regimes and Israel was to actually put the Palestinian question under the rug. And so to try to flip it suddenly that and, and any attempt to use normalization right now in the eyes of the Arab regimes, part of that is still to is still to do that. And because normalization is also so tied into how the Arab regimes are trying to keep their uh or even advance their relations with the United States means that they can't push the U.S. further than they would otherwise try. Like beyond certain rhetorics and certain nudges, they're not applying that. And three months later, those Arab states are still not applying that, nor are they applying it towards Israel, despite a few symbolic pressures here and there. So I think this is the issue that needs to be broken. Um, and then I was saying like the, the, the way that Arab public discontent is is rising and rising, but they live under authoritarian regimes and unable to apply that pressure. In at least Western states where, you know, despite numerous kinds of, uh, you know, attacks and crackdowns on Palestine activism, or even again, the twisted um, narrative around, cease, uh, around ceasefires, I think this is where at least that needs to be uh, pushed even harder. Uh, European states do have certain leverage that can be affected by the public. The United States does have le leverage that uh, much of the public is starting to push for. Um, and that needs to be applied in full force. I mean, I mean I'm calling here from, from here in London, where the massive protests we've been seeing here in the city, the, the MPs are trying to ignore it. Um, and your and your cabinet ministers and your shadow ministers, like, and this needs to be se seared very heavily. But and the fact that Palestinians have to do all this just to get the bombs to stop, I think is very telling of this massive power asymmetry in the way that policy is applied in a way that there's a disconnect between governments and what people think worldwide, and the need to recalibrate that in any kind of solution. That power asymmetry is so central to how this conflict operates, to who gets to have a say in the day of today and the day after, and why that needs to be radically recalibrated in order to give Palestinians agency, to give people who see a different kind of uh, scenario for both sides, for, for both peoples, in a different in a different kind of power dynamic than what we've seen in the past several decades. I'd like to thank all of our speakers for giving so generously of their time in such a emotionally and professionally demanding context as we're in right now. Um, before we wrap up, I'd just like to remind our audience about our next policy and practice event next Thursday. We'll be back to our normal in-person format with an event on where next for net zero, UK climate policy at a crossroads. So slightly different topic, but um, I'm sure it'll be a good discussion as well. And you can sign up on our website or Eventbrite. If you don't already, please follow us on Twitter or Instagram. Our handle is UCLSPP. Once again, this um, discussion will be made available as a recording. You can feel free to share it with, um, with friends, colleagues, others. Thank you again, sincerely to our speakers. Thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us. Take care, everyone. Have a good evening.